Welcome back to our series on Bible study under the heading of Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. This series of helpful hints on Bible study is being presented by the Christadelphian Video Service to encourage people to go a little deeper in their Bible study. And we've been doing our sessions on imagination. We had a session on imagination recently, and we're now looking at another session on imagination because we want to get you into the mode of reading your Bible carefully and living out the scenario in front of you. The picture on the screen is trying to portray the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. He was probably a man that was getting towards his 90s and a very very much in exile, very uncomfortable circumstances, but able to write. And you can just imagine what it was like sitting there, cut off from all the people that he loved. Um, you couldn't just have a phone call in those days. You had to think about the people that you'd like to write to. And so he was given a chance to write a letter to all the ecclesias that he knew. And of course, it was the, the great revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, just imagining the scene that he talked about being the companions in the kingdom and in tribulation. And you can imagine the tribulations John had been through in that exile on Patmos. So we're looking at these things in yellow, particularly the inquiring mind, the, the asking of questions, the unusual expressions, the exceptions, reading carefully, listening for Bible echoes, tracing the significance of places and names. We'll do some of those in this session. Getting that middle picture, collecting the facts, living out the scene, getting the feelings. And of course, always we've got to look for the exhortations that come out of the things that we discover. Now, remember, we looked at Acts 6 and 7 as part of your homework from the last session. Um, why would the priest suddenly join the faith? Well, it was the resurrection. The priests had vehemently opposed the Lord Jesus Christ because he was a great threat to their income. Josephus tells us at this time in history, there were about 100,000 priests in Israel. There were so many of them, they got to work perhaps two to four weeks a year, but they had become very fat and overfed because of they were eating so many of the people's offerings. And it was a very, very good life to be a priest in those days. So when Jesus came along and threatened their religion and their, their, their livelihood, they were very keen to get rid of him. And they thought they had, but he rose from the dead. And nobody with any right mind could believe that the body had been stolen, the grave had been sealed, it had guards on it, it had the governor's seal on it, and yet that tomb was open and it was empty. And so the priests joined the faith. They also saw the miracles. They saw Peter released from prison. They saw the man at the beautiful gate being healed by the disciples. They had plenty of, of, of indications that God was at work amongst these people. They heard the the day of Pentecost, everyone speaking in different languages. So, you know, the, the priests eventually had to face the fact that this was something of God and they joined the faith. They joined the ecclesia. What would it mean? Well, for most of them, it would mean a loss of income. It would mean a loss of their right to take of the sacrifices and the tithes and the offerings. They would be poverty stricken. Again, you can see the need that was, that arose for the Jerusalem poor fund to look after the poor saints in Jerusalem. Many of those priests, when Saul began his persecution, would have had to leave the city and go to other places. And we're told they did that and preached the gospel as they went. So again, God was getting priests into the ecclesia. They might be ambassadors for Christ when they went out from Jerusalem. Just a little verse that just says many priests joined the faith has so many implications in it. And in chapter 6, verse 9, he was from Cilicia. Well, of course, that was Saul, the Pharisee, who was arguing with Stephen. And you can see then why he was the witness at Stephen's execution. In chapter 7, Stephen gives numerous examples of God working outside the land of Israel. When you colour them in, they become very obvious. The point that Stephen is making is that he was being charged with desecrating and, and talking about the destruction of God's holy place. And, and basically saying that you didn't have to worship in the temple at Jerusalem. And, of course, by making the point that God had worked through the Israel's history in many, many other places, he angered the Jews, who had put a great store in their temple. And, of course, in the end, they stoned Stephen. What did the vision mean to Stephen? Well, it says in the vision that Christ was not sitting at the right hand of God, 
he was standing at the right hand of God, which was a mark of respect for Stephen. But also, in Stephen's case, as he was about to die, for him the Lord was about to return. The words that Stephen spoke, forgive them, they know not what they do. Um, I pray it may not be later their charge. Stephen was, was picking up the spirit of Christ, but he was also saying that he wanted those who were persecuting him to be forgiven, and that included Saul. And so those words were true in the case of Paul the Pharisee. He was forgiven by God of the terrible things he was doing to Stephen. You go to the second of Timothy chapter 4, and you find that Paul quotes those words himself about people who had let him down at the time when he was about to die. And you can see what an impression Stephen had made upon the Apostle Paul who quoted those last words of Stephen. So many things you can just develop a little further. I've just given you a thumbnail sketch of some of the things in that homework section from last week. Let's come to the second of Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to talk here about a, a terrific incident in the days of the King Jehoshaphat when he was attacked by a combination of nations that wanted to destroy Israel. In verse 1, we're told it was the Moabites, the Ammonites. Later on, we're told there were Edomites there as well. They all gathered these, this whole confederacy of nations to come against the nation of Judah to try and wipe it out. So there were many, and there were many nations involved. And, and Judah is not allowed to, to defend themselves against these people because God had said that they were not to attack Ammon and Moab. Um, and that was something that, that God had said right back when they first came into the land. So Jehoshaphat has to put the matter before God. So what he does is he calls an assembly of the whole nation. Um, you read in verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of the house of God. And there were, everybody was there, men, women and children were there. And he actually then it brings them into the new court. So it was a very big space in Solomon's temple. And he makes this prayer to God. And it's a beautiful prayer about God had told them they, they can't attack the Ammonites and the Moabites. And now these people are coming against us. What can we do? And so we come down to verse 12. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. So he gives this beautiful prayer. And puts the matter in God's hands. Now you just picture the scene. There was probably fifty to a hundred thousand people packed into the temple court. Have you ever been in a crowd that size? That it's incredibly amazing the, the 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 vibes that come from a crowd of people like that. They were packed in, and there was a choir there. The temple choir was there, and they're all waiting. And they're waiting. And there's silence. Just imagine the tension. What will God do? The enemies are marching up towards them. And they put it in God's hands. And then suddenly from the choir, a young man yells out, God spoke to me. And you can imagine all the eyes riveted on this young man. And Jehoshaphat saying to him, come down here, come down here to me. And down he comes. And you think, look at the description that's given of who this young man is. In verse 14, upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. Now normally the, the record would stop at that point, but it doesn't. It just keeps going with five generations. The son of Beniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of Yahweh in the midst of the congregation. So God has now poured his spirit upon one particular man, and he's in the choir because he's a son of Asaph. They were the singers. And, and that's really important to what happens in the rest of this chapter. So here are five generations given. Now, that's very, very unusual. What was vile about this man was he was a son of Asaph. So, so Jehoshaphat says, right, he's the son of Asaph, he's a singer. God's chosen to answer me through a singer. And look at this genealogy of this man, because the answer was in the names. 
And Jehoshaphat got it. He got the point of the message, and he got the point of the fact that God had chosen a singer. So then he orders something unusual. What he does is he says to the people, in verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face toward the ground, and all Judah and the heaven of Jerusalem fell before Yahweh, worshipping Yahweh. And the Levites, the sons of the Kohathites, the children of the Korahites, stood up to praise Yahweh, God of Israel, with a loud voice on high. And of course, Asaph was of the sons of Korah. So these were the singers. They began to praise God for the answer they'd be given. So again, singing comes into it. And then in the morning, as the enemies are approaching them, something unusual happens. And look at verse 21. Jehoshaphat, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto Yahweh, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to sing, praise Yahweh for his mercy endures forever. Now you just pictured the scene. This is what we needed to get the imagination. Here are the armies that are coming against them, millions of them marching up towards Jerusalem. All their weapons, their siege engines. And out of Jerusalem comes the army of Jehoshaphat. And in front of them are the sons of Asaph with their hymn books. Isn't that an incredibly unusual scene? They're in front of the army. Not a place a singer would be. All he's got is his hymn book. And they're singing. Look what happens in verse 20. When they began to sing, God went into action. And he brought amb ambushments upon the children of Ammon and the Edomites and all the others that were there. And, and God collapsed walls upon them and cliffs fell down on them. And in the end, they ended up beating each other to death. And, and you know, God sorted them out, no problem, because of the singers. So what an amazing scene. So God signified his approval and he responded through this singer. And, of course, we've got to think about a lesson that comes from this. Well, there are lessons to take out of it. Let's just go back over what we've had. This is the answer that God gave. Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Mataniah. What can you deduce from that? Well, here's what we deduce. It was an answer. A singer was chosen for the message. Jehaziel, God sees. Zechariah, God hath remembered. He remembered his covenant he made with Abraham, that he would look after Israel. He would curse them that cursed Israel. Benaiah, Yah has built. God's put you in this land. Jael, God will sweep away. Mataniah, it's the gift of Yahweh. And yet the answer was there in those five generations that we were given. Here's where names becomes the significant answer that was given to Jehoshaphat. What an incredible thing. And so he sent out singers in front of the army. And you can go through the rest of the chapter in verse 26, verse 27, verse 28, and you read about singing and happiness and joy. And, of course, the lesson is the joy of Yahweh should be your strength. The praising of God is greater than any army. Okay, well, let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we have the record of the woman of Samaria. It's only in the Gospel of John. And a lot of detail about this interaction between Jesus and this woman. But I want to just pick up on one or two little things. It's, it's a very well-known story. We're not going to go into the, the exhortation that Jesus gave. I want to just pick up some details to encourage us to question the record. Now, it says there in verse 4 that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Is that just saying, well, he got lost? Because you see, normally the Jews would not go through Samaria. Jews would go down the Jordan Valley. Um, they would go from Jerusalem down to Jericho, up the Jordan Valley and up the Valley of Jezreel to make this journey that Jesus was making. But no, Jesus goes straight through Samaria, a place that the Jews would not normally go. But it says he had to go there. Why? Well, Jesus was looking for Joseph. Because Joseph and his brothers were all buried at Samaria in the, in the city of Sychar, near Jacob's well. So Jesus had a, an appointment, if you like, with Joseph. Joseph was the great type of Jesus in the Old Testament. So Jesus is going to think about Joseph. 
Well, what season was it? Well, it was summer. The harvest was white, ready to be harvested. The harvest had gone from green to white, ready to be harvested. So it was summer. What time of day was it? We thought it was midday. So at the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, it was hot. What's the physical feature here that matters? Well, there's only one particular item that matters. It's Jacob's well. So again, we're going back to the family of Jacob and Joseph. Would Jesus sit in the sun? No. But you see, all of these wells that people dug, they were normally dug under what was called terebinth trees, called oak trees in the Old Testament. But you will find the oak of Bethel, the oak of Shechem. Um, you find a number of these, these significant trees. They were huge trees that grew, usually solitary. But they dug the wells underneath them because when they were watering their sheep, when it was the middle of the day, they wanted to get out of the sun, they would go to the well, water their sheep, and they could sit into the shade. So it was a place of meeting. It was a place where people went to talk and exchange news. And it was a place of rest. So Jesus would not be sitting in the sun. Then we come to verse 28. And it says, the woman left her water pot. Well, did we need to know that? Is that important? By well, this stage, Jesus has convinced the woman that he's the Messiah. She's raced off to the city to tell the others and to bring them out to talk to Jesus. Why do we need to know she left her water pot? How many nations made up the Samaritans? Well, you go back to 2 Kings 17, you'll find there were five nations that were brought by the Babylonians to fill the land of Israel after the Jews had been taken away. So there were five husbands that they'd had. And now the Samaritans had tried to, to combine their religion with the Jewish religion. And so the one she now had was also not her true husband. So again, the number of men involved in the story here is relating to the history of the Samaritans. Verse 42 has an echo. A saviour of the world. Where have we seen that before? Well, we've seen that back in the book of Genesis. Joseph was called the saviour of the world. Safnath Paneah. So again, there's an echo here that's telling us this is this whole story is being based around Jacob's well and the story of Joseph. Well, the last question, the woman left her water pot near the well of Jacob, that is under the oak of Shechem. What other things are there? Well, there's a lot of things there. Worth going through the scriptures to find them. You'll find that there is, for example, under the oak of Shechem, the idols of Jacob's house are there. There's some of the stones that Moses wrote on are there. Things to do. So go through and look up all the things that are at Shechem. Many, many things are there. But the most important thing was at Shechem was the bones of Joseph were there. And you can imagine when Jesus sent his disciples away and he sat on the well, he was thinking about Joseph. How much Joseph had suffered to portray the life of the Lord Jesus Christ centuries down through history. And I have a little saying that I think is probably appropriate. I think the bones of Joseph would have been rattling with excitement to know that Jesus was here. But but you can just imagine, can't you, that what a thing it was to sit there and to think about Joseph. And, you know, Shechem had been the place where a daughter of Jacob had gone out of the camp of Jacob into the city and become corrupted. And what Jesus looks up and what does he see? He sees a corrupted daughter of the city of Shechem coming out to Jacob's will. Dinah is coming home. You know, there's a lot of beautiful things you can do with this record when you see that it's actually based on the life of Jacob and Joseph. Okay, well, we'll now come to our homework on this section on imagination. We're asking you to compare the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 with the Second of Chronicles chapter 28. And when you read the Second of Chronicles 28, get a picture of what it was like for the, for the captives on that particular occasion. How far had they walked? Were they hungry? Were they well clothed? Did they have any shoes? Where were their husbands? And just paint the scene of what that group was like. Look how many there were in the Second of Chronicles 28 and what condition they were in. And it's a great little exercise to just go to the Second of Chronicles 28 and just colour in the things from the Second of Chronicles 28 that you find in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because the people who helped them are the Old Testament Good Samaritans. 
it happened at Samaria. So when Jesus gave that parable, he was thinking about something that happened in the past. Now you need to read the context. You need to read the words the prophet Oded. And there's where the lesson will come through to us. The lesson that comes out of what these people did and why they did it. And just think of the enormity of what they had to do to correct this problem that they had created against the people of Judah. So here's a great story, finding the parable of the Old Testament Good Samaritans and working out the similarities between these two records. And then, of course, as we always do, finding out the true lessons.